morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got quite a few people um, still dialing in, but uh, let's get started. It's just a little after 10 a.m. here in Sydney right now. So today's session, we wanted to focus on the fundamentals of marketing automation, and in all reality, I've no idea how we get that done in an hour. But, uh, but still, let's, uh, let's uh, capture a few, a few key points and we'll jump a little bit between the slides uh, and also Eloqua so we can see a few things in action as well. But um, effectively, this, uh, this session has really come about from a number of discussions that we've had over the last month or two with some customers where we've identified uh, some specific campaigns that were really not taking advantage of the automation uh, that people had available to them from within Eloqua. So based on that and, uh, and then asking a few more questions, we thought there would be value in uh, spending some time here in the user group just to sort of go back to some of the basics and really just recap on some of the key things that you can achieve with Eloqua. So uh, at a high level today, what we'd like to do is really focus on the basics and understand what the basics are. Uh, at the same time, trying to understand from a big picture point of view why it is we're doing the things that we're doing. So we need to, are there data considerations? Uh, what's the experience that we're trying to deliver? Etc. We'll talk through some of those. Uh, look at a couple of examples specifically that actually brought on this particular uh, topic for the user group this month. Um, and then also just some considerations, some things to think about because once you automate, uh, there are some things you need to think through and, um, and we'll uh, try and cover some of those for you today. The basics. When we think about the basics, I was really kind of trying to think about, well, really, what are the basics of marketing automation? So we took a stab and uh, we arrived at a list that looks something like this. So it's really about understanding your CRM data and your Eloqua data. So what's the relationship between those two? So whether your system is integrated with the CRM or if you're using Excel spreadsheets to upload information into Eloqua, uh, at the, the, irrelevant of the connection point and how that's done, you still need to be aware of that data. So um, we'll explore that in a bit of detail for you. So engaging and not spamming it has to be one of the basics. If, if we could all go back to the boardrooms where the presentations were made when your organization decided to purchase Eloqua, it would be interesting to understand the expectations of the, the buyers within your various organizations as to what they're after. And certainly engaging with contacts versus just simply spamming them, I'm sure would have been high on the priority list. And so we'll revisit that and look at ways you can do that. One of the key ways you can do that though is through multi-step campaigns. And multi-step campaigns in concert with your emails, your forms, landing pages, etc. And then really it's about understanding how we can automate as much as possible. Because at the end of the day, you're really using a marketing automation platform, not just simply an email marketing platform. So we want to look at how we can do that. And one of the keys to really making any progress in relation to the overall effectiveness of your campaigns is really making the time to actually analyze the performance of those campaigns. And so we'll have a little look at Insight and just give you a little bit of an update as well on, on things that are changing with Insight over the next uh, three to five months. The first thing, you have to love or maybe at least get data. It's hard to be a digital marketer today uh, running campaigns like you are running without having an appreciation <laughs> for data and the constructs uh, that exist. So most of you will have a CRM, uh, and that CRM is potentially uh, connected in some way to Eloqua. Now depending on the size of your organization, you may also have an ERP system. So the ERP system is that usually that big gnarly back-end system that is your financials, uh, etc. Now in the CRM, you've got loads of objects, and so we call them the lead object, the contact object, account, etc., etc. The one at the bottom there you can see is called a customer data object and so a custom data object is typically built specifically for your organization so if you're in the business of providing specific types of um, physical products and those products may come with warranties you may have a custom data object that holds warranty information and so that would have a relationship back to the contact and then back to the account as well now if you've got Eloqua which you do because you're on the call today you would have a contact now you'll notice that within Eloqua there is no lead construct necessarily. There's just the contact. So Eloqua looks into your CRM and it sees those people as either a lead or a contact and you can easily identify those from an Eloqua point of view through things like CRM IDs. So there'd be a lead ID and a contact ID and so you can do segmentation 
to easily identify who's who within that whole process. In addition to that, Eloqua has an account object and that typically relates to the account within the CRM. But you'll notice with the arrow that we've got there that as far as Eloqua is concerned, largely account information is read only. The only reason we really have account information in Eloqua is to help you from a segmentation point of view and to help you from a personalization point of view. So from a segmentation point of view, you're able to go into Eloqua and say, give me all contacts who work at Acme Constructions, for instance. So it'll bring back all of the contacts that meet that criteria based on the data you've got from your CRM. In addition to that, you would have potentially the opportunities also coming through. Now Eloqua sees that as a custom data object, which is kind of immaterial, um, but it does help explain while the interface maybe is a little bit different when you're working with opportunities. Now most of you will also have campaigns, going backwards and forwards, and again, that, con that construct of a customer data object. So if we run with that example of the custom data object in the CRM holding warranty information, it's typical that a warranty obviously would have an expiry date at some point. And that could be really helpful to the marketing team uh, because they can then access and build segments based on the expiry dates of particular products. So you could build a segment in Eloqua saying, give me all customers who have product XYZ and have an expiry date that takes place within the next 30 days. So that could then become a trigger-based campaign that goes straight out to people reminding them that their warranty does expire in, in 30 days and then potentially giving them the opportunity to purchase additional or extended warranty. So that's part of the reason as to why you would want to look at integrating information from the CRM system uh, into Eloqua. Now on the ERP side of things, uh, we won't cover this too much and that's partially why I've colored it gray, uh, but the ERP is often the source of truth for information about account and contact um, and potentially warranty, stock levels, financials, and there can be a load of other things in there, but that's a whole other discussion and I promise we won't go into that in too much detail. But I find whenever we have this type of a conversation, I often get this sort of a reaction. And I can totally get it. it um, for those of us who are maybe not buried in this sort of stuff every day, it can be a pain in the butt. But if we understand these sort of things, it can make a massive difference to the effectiveness of your campaigns. And so really I'm trying to get you from that state to this state. If we, if we understand data and we understand the relationship of that data to Eloqua and to the contact, and the information that's available, and sometimes it's really just understanding the information that's available. Um, it, it's fairly, f um, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's fairly frequent that we have conversations with customers where there's been changes made uh, within the organization, uh, there's new information now flowing into the CRM system, uh, and so additional fields would be really helpful from an Eloqua point of view. Adding that information to the integration, if the integration is already set up, is quite an easy process. We can easily execute that for you, um, it can take literally just an hour or so, uh, including testing, to make that happen. So if you do have data sitting in the CRM but it's not visible within Eloqua, uh, it's quite easy to make it visible. So that's one of the basics. The other one we wanted to talk about was this notion of engaging and not spamming. So you've got lots of options in relation to the way you engage using the Campaign Canvas. And as we've said there, it's often, it often means really sending less emails and not necessarily sending more emails. And so the engagement process really means that you have to do some listening. But there's some fundamentals, I suppose, that will help in relation to making sure that we're not spamming. So if your Campaign Canvases largely look like the one you can see on my screen right now, I would suggest that you're probably doing a little bit of spamming. This particular campaign canvas really is just a segment uh, where we're shooting out an email and that's it, game over. Really what you want to do is understand how you can listen um, to, to your customers. So if that's the type of approach you're taking, I'd really suggest that we need to sort of stop, have a think, uh, and look at ways that we can improve. And that would come in several ways. It would come with a better understanding of the segmentation process. So if we're, if we're building smarter segments, um, we've got a much better chance uh, of having a much better campaign result. So what is engaging? 
from our point of view and from looking at, at many campaigns across many customers, engaging is much more about smarter segmentation. Um, and it's also about thinking through dynamic segments. So dynamic segments is where where you create, you, you use filters. So instead of just simply uploading an Excel spreadsheet or having a fixed or static list of people, a dynamic segment is based on filters. So it's people who have done this, this, or this within the last three weeks. And it's people that have done this, this, or this uh, within the last week. And they've looked at this page, or this page, or this page on the website. <clears throat> so building a dynamic segment then means that over the course of the campaign, which might run for two or three days, or it could run for two or three months, people are constantly being added to the campaign as soon as they meet the filter criteria within your segment. This is much more about engaging than it is about spamming because what you're really doing is you're trying to identify the right time to engage with people based on their behavior. And so that behavior is the digital body language. And so if we're listening to the, digi <coughs> excuse me, the digital body language and then analyzing that and then moving people into respective campaigns, we're in a much better position. Um, and this can generally lead, as I said, to really sending less emails, not sending more emails. And the other key thing that it really does is if we're basing segments on a person's digital body language, we're really engaging with them or responding to them when they're interested. So if they're spending time on the website and they're looking at a, a certain subset of pages that relate to a particular topic, what better time than to potentially engage with them by sending an email uh, and inviting them to learn more about what it is they've just been looking at. And that could be through a white paper offer, it could be through a video, uh, it could be through arranging a phone call to have a chat with somebody that talks a little bit more about that particular product. So there are all sorts of ways that you can engage. But what is engaging and how does Eloqua see engaging? So there are various steps on the campaign canvas that really are the listening ones and they've all got question marks after them. From an engagement point of view, if somebody's clicking on an email, if they've opened an email, uh, submitted forms, shared lists are another way uh, to listen to what people are doing because typically you'd be moving people around into various shared lists based on their behavior. Now the shared filter, and we'll talk a little bit more about shared filters later this morning, but shared filters are an underutilized step available on the campaign canvas, and they really basically give you all of the functionality that you have available within segments. So in segments, as you've all played with segments at various times, uh, you can apply all of those same metrics and all of those same things while the campaign is actually in motion. The next step there is visited website. Now one thing to be aware, and this is definitely a good one to cover under the basic, what Eloqua is actually asking there, when we say visited website, you'll identify when you use that step, you'll see there's no <coughs> individual URL that you can apply to that particular question. So the answer to that question is if they've touched any page that you have the Eloqua tracking code listed. So that could be a home page, it might be other microsites, uh, it could be an e-store, there could be a whole range of locations that you've loaded the Eloqua tracking code. So that's what that's asking. If you wanted to be more specific, so for instance, you've got a subset of pages uh, that relate to a particular topic and it might in combination be five or six pages, you would use a shared filter to ask that question. So in the context of a specific campaign, simply visited website may not be specific enough. You may want to break it down a little bit. And so you could use a shared filter to list each of the URLs that represent the pages that are in context of your campaign. And that way you can get a much more specific outcome. Now the other thing to remember too in relation to submitted form, uh, this is another one that uh, sometimes can confuse people. So submitted form uh, only references people who are members of your campaign. So when you lay out your campaign canvas and you put in 5,000 people into that segment, as they flow through, once they get to the point where it says submitted form, it's only asking the question, have any of those campaign members submitted that form? Now in many cases that may be exactly right and that's, there's no problem with that. The time that it's generally not the best option is when you're running an event. So if you, for instance, send an email to me inviting me to come to your event, but you don't invite Marika, who's sitting here next to me, and I think to myself, you know what, Marika, I think you should attend this event. So I forward her the email. 
when she goes ahead and registers for that event, unless we've got the add to campaign in the form processing step, she's not a campaign member. Okay? So if you need to explore that further, please come back and we can talk about it. But the key thing to remember is it's only answering the question, has a campaign member submitted a form? That's part of the way that we engage. And the reason we go through that process is basically so you can do a range of things. And these are the things that you can do. And there are more. I just sort of really ran out of screen real estate. But um, all sorts of things. You can move people from one campaign to another, or you can add them to a campaign. So these two features, again, are quite underutilized uh, from what I see uh, looking at uh, various campaigns. These can be really, really helpful. Uh, so when you move someone to a campaign, that means you take them out of the existing one and you move them to another one. If you're adding them to the campaign, that means they stay in the existing campaign and you're actually adding them to a second campaign. Uh, sometimes the sent email can be quite helpful because generally what you're doing there is you're referencing, um, you're asking the question largely, have we sent an email generally from a different campaign. And so that one can be quite helpful. Compare contact fields is also very helpful. That one enables you to identify is the person in New South Wales or are they in uh, Queensland, are they in Singapore, where are they? Uh, so you can use all of the fields that you've got available on the contact in order to do that. Um, the compare date step, this one here at the top in the middle, the compare date is a new step on the campaign canvas and we'll explore that one a little bit later this morning in a bit more detail. The custom object field, so remember when we went back to that um, discussion earlier in relation to the CRM and we talked about custom data objects, so this is where you would utilize this step to access warranty information was the example that we provided or you might be wanting to see if a contact is currently in an open and live opportunity. Uh, in which case you may want to stop communications and leave the salespeople to, to finish off that particular deal. There are all sorts of actions you can do as well, and you can see here, for instance, the move to shared list uh, is another helpful one. So you can, based on people's behavior, if people are engaging in a campaign, you may route them through the campaign. However, after two or three attempts of trying to reach somebody, if they're not responding uh, to your email communications, you may want to move them to a shared list, which then potentially could be sent to the call center to make some outbound phone calls. So there can be all sorts of reasons as to why you might want to move people to a shared list. Programs, for people who've been using Eloqua for quite some time, programs are quite helpful in many ways. They're often used to, to cleanse data, to kick off specific synchronization things with the CRM or other systems that you might have with, uh, with the platform. Um, external activities is another one that you can do. So the external activity construct basically enables you to record something that's happened in the physical world uh, with something that's happening. So it's so something's happened in the physical world and bring that information into Eloqua. And really the reason you basically use external activities is because you want to be able to segment by that behavior at some point. Um, we find uh, a lot of our customers are using external activity along with the SMS uh, application that we have. And so what they'll do is they'll send the SMS and then immediately follow that with an external activity to record against the contact that a particular SMS has been sent. So again, they do that so they can segment by it at a later point. Um, program builder and also cloud connectors uh, in relation to various apps, etc., mm -hmm. that are available. So the big picture, what is the big picture? Well, the big picture means that from time to time, we really need to step back and look at the campaign, um, I suppose get out of the trenches, so to speak, and really understand what's going on. So the source of truth. The source of truth is really critical, and for many of you, the source of truth will be the CRM. Uh, the CRM is typically where that information rests, and whether that's coming in, as I said, via integration, or it's coming in through Excel spreadsheets, uh, it can really come in either way. Now, the quality of your data. Now, I hear some people say, well, we don't trust the data. You know, we're not 100% sure on the data. Look, I think if you ever waited for your data to be 100% accurate, you probably would never send a single campaign. So we just need to, we need to have some faith in the data. And, and, but there are things you can do along the way to do some quick checking on some of the key things. And we'll show you a couple of those in just a moment. Also understanding the experience that you want to deliver. It's not just simply, okay, I've got a message, here's my email. 
Bulldog, bang, out it goes. What's the actual experience and what's the outcome? What do you want the outcome to be of that campaign? What is the experience that you need to deliver? Um, and then also campaign reporting. I sat with a customer the other day. We had the Oracle event in Melbourne, uh, the Oracle user group meeting, and one of my customers was there. And uh, once it wrapped up, we sat down and she was wanting to get some campaign reporting. And I said, well, look, let's start with the campaign overview report. It's probably the easiest uh, report. It gives you a good high-level summary. Um, and so what we did is we set that up for, it took us about five or 10 minutes. Um, we set that up and what that's going to do is every Monday morning, she'll receive an email, uh, which is an Excel file and it will summarize all of the campaigns they've been running over the last week. Uh, that just automatically pops into her inbox and we decided to, because they're a large organization, there's many users, we broke it down so specifically it's just the members of her team. So she's going to have a little look at that as it comes in, digest that with the team and just gives them that chance to do that little bit of analysis and it could literally just be a 10 minute exercise at the beginning of each week. The source of truth things to think about around source of truth and also in the construct of, of data quality um, is, as an example, this second bullet point that you can see here on the screen. If, if we have somebody and their name is Jonathan, and that's how we have them listed in the CRM is as Jonathan, what happens if John fills in a form and changes his name to John. Now my argument is of course that the customer clearly knows what their name is and they clearly know how they want to be referenced and addressed uh, by you as an organization. So from an integration point of view, you've got to think about what happens when that information goes back into the CRM. Do you want Eloqua to win? Should Eloqua then override what's sitting in the CRM? Some customers have a hard time with this one um, from a data integrity point of view because then there might be an ERP system attached to that as well. And so what some people do is they'll use the standard construct of first name in the CRM to be Jonathan uh, and then they might have another field called nickname or preferred name or something like that. And so it's actually the preferred name field that integrates with Eloqua. Uh, and the first name field is simply the domain of the CRM. So there are certainly ways, that way you're accommodating what the customer wants. So the customer wants us to call him John, not Jonathan. And then the CRM team want to have Jonathan, and so that's okay. The CRM team and the ERP team can have Jonathan as well. Now how many of you, and maybe if we can throw this question out to the group, is anybody using the contact washing machine? So the contact washing machine is an app that you can add to the campaign canvas. Uh, it's a free app, there's no charge for that. And what that does, it helps you improve the the data quality, especially with some of the basics like um, you can see here on the bottom of the page there I've got Jonathan with a uh, lowercase j. If you run that through the, uh, the washing machine app it then enables you to correct that and have it as proper case. So lowercase j then becomes a capital J. And so these things can easily be added. What you would do there basically is have the segment sitting on the canvas you would immediately go through the contact washing machine and that's where you tell it to do that, change one to the other, and then you would send your email. So that way when your email goes out, there's very little chance that you're going to ever address, uh, in this case, Jonathan with a lowercase j. So there are simple things you can do there to improve the overall quality uh, of the experience. As I was thinking this one through yesterday, quality is generally, as I sit here, it's more of a constant journey than it is a destination. Uh, it's very rare that you'll be in a state where you can go into a meeting and say, hey, our data is perfect. It just doesn't happen. But there are things you can do to constantly work on improving the quality of your data. Certainly smart form processing steps is a really good way to do that. Um, apps like the contact washing machine are great ways to help with that data quality. And then looking at what you're able to send back to the CRM can really help. So if the CRM is the source of truth, perhaps there needs to be some discussion between the marketing team and the CRM team to look at how Eloqua can really help to improve the data quality uh, that's sitting uh, within the CRM. A, a simple example uh, would be something like salesperson. So that last bullet point that you can see down there. So from a salesperson's point of view, they typically would own the relationship um, and that really is the domain of the CRM. And so when Eloqua was looking at personalizing a communication and sending out an email and it coming from the contact owner, generally the salesperson, uh, that information pulls directly from the CRM. 
Now, of course, what happens when Jamie Smith, who's one of the salespeople, leaves the organization? What happens? Uh, well, Eloqua will continue to send emails from Jamie Smith unless the CRM is actually updated. Now, a smart CRM uh, administrator is able to do that sort of thing on mass uh, and take all of the previous salesperson's details and assign them to a new salesperson, um, and that information will flow through to Eloqua typically within 15 minutes, depending on the integration between your organization, but it would typically be 15 minutes or maybe 30 minutes. So those things need to be considered, and this is where we need to understand the ramifications of these things as we're building out campaigns, uh, to especially where personalization is included. From a customer experience point of view, that becomes uh, reflective, I suppose, of your organization, uh, and the type of experience and the uh, the branding that you have as an organization. But the campaign canvas is a great way to really help you map out that experience. So if you're trying to develop a campaign and you're really thinking through and you're sort of brainstorming that process, if you've got a room with a nice big projector, which I'm sure most of you probably do, you go ahead and throw the campaign canvas up on the screen and actually begin to build out the process. What does the campaign look like, at least the digital component of the campaign? What does that look like? And look at the various communications that you want to have and the, the wait times between them. And then if people do this, what should we do? If they don't do this, what should we do? The campaign canvas is a really visual tool to help you do that. And then, of course, campaign outcomes. Once you're really clear about what you need from the campaign, there are a number of ways that you can uh, achieve that. Form processing steps are a great way. So if people are registering for an event and or they're downloading a white paper and they're asking for specific things, depending on the response that they give you, you can then use the form processing steps to send out different communications. So if, for instance, people, we we'll use an event as an example. So if you're running an event, you've got a single form where you're asking people to register for Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, Adelaide, um, you can have all of that on a single form. Then utilizing the form processing step, you could have confirmation emails that are then specific to each of those different geographies. Uh, and then you can push out the relevant confirmation email to the right person based on the city that they're registering for. And so that's done through using the logic in the back of the processing step. You don't need to have multiple uh, landing pages with multiple forms to deliver those unique emails. They can all be taken care of uh, on a single form with a single landing page. One area that we see constantly seems to come up and, and there seems to be all sorts of mystical uh, understandings of what this is. So the campaign start date and end date. Eloqua made some changes recently, which I'm, I'm not really quite sure I understand why, but the default now for campaign end date is 12 months beyond the date that you launch it. Now that's not very helpful where you're specifically wanting to look at campaigns that have run, for instance, within the last week or the last quarter, et cetera, because the, that information is pulled from the campaign dates. So. In this example, if you're running a campaign that is for three weeks, uh, the insight reporting will obviously work for that entire period. But what we need to understand is once your campaign finishes, Eloqua continues to capture information, any behavior, email click-throughs, downloads, opens, etc for 12 months after the end date of your campaign. If your campaign is quite simple and it might really only go for two or three days, and, and what's today, Tuesday the 22nd, so you launch the campaign today and it finishes on Thursday, there's no reason the end date for your campaign needs to be November 2017. The end date for your campaign, what we do is choose just a standard date and what we do is we always choose the date after the last email will go. And so that just creates continuity and gives us much better levels of granularity in the reporting. So when we look at a report and we ask for last quarter, we know that what we're looking at is in fact campaigns that were run last quarter. Otherwise it can become, well, it becomes pretty useless to you. So have, have a, a think about that, understand how that works. And again, in a moment, we'll show you exactly where that information is. The other aspect to campaign reporting is what we call campaign fields. Now these campaign fields are not required, but they can be made to be required. Uh, and there's three constructs. You can also add additional ones, but these are the sort of three out of the box ones, which are product, region, and campaign type. Now. We can't change the actual uh, terminology there of product, region, and campaign type. However, the values that we place in those drop-down fields is completely up to you. 
So anything you drop here in the please select is completely up to you. The process to do this, by the way, literally is a, it's a five minute process to add this information. It's just really creating a pick list uh, at the end of the day. What takes more time is deciding and agreeing as a team um, what are the values that we're going to place in there. Now many of our customers operate across regions, whether it be across just Australia, New Zealand or into Asia uh, or even through uh, Europe and North America. And so region becomes a, a clear a no-brainer decision to do. And so if you're trying to look at campaign performance and then look at that reporting based on your region, it becomes very difficult to do unless you've got a ridiculously strong uh, naming convention, uh, which is not always the case. Region makes it a no-brainer. You can then come in, pull up all of your campaigns that have taken place within Australia or Australia and New Zealand or just Singapore or maybe you, break, you do Southern Asia versus Northern Asia, uh, etc. So whatever the, the geographical boundaries are that you're typically working in, being able to break your information down by region is simple. Um, and that's very easy to achieve. Okay, so let me share with you a recent example uh, of a customer who was one of the reasons we came up with this topic uh, for this particular webinar. So they have a, a campaign they're running, it's running for 12 months uh, is my understanding, and what they need to do was effectively send out an updated email uh, well, sorry, let me start again. People would, would uh, visit a particular landing page, uh, which wasn't an eligible landing page, but it had an offer to gain access to their online store uh, for the period of, uh, I think it's 90 days. And so just from a security point of view, IT decided that the, it would be best if we created 12 separate logins one for each month, uh, et cetera. And once people received that information, they then have access, I think it was for 90 days. And so what the, the team were doing was they were basically manually creating that a whole new campaign at the beginning of each month. Now, the question that I had of the team relates to that second bullet point there, which was when do you have access to those logins? And IT had actually provided those logins to the team uh, in advance. So they had all 12 logins ready to go and they were time bound, one for January, February, March, etc., throughout the year. So what we did is instead of them having to create a separate canvas at the beginning of each month, uh, we just have created a single campaign canvas. And then what we did is we used the compare date function to understand. So as people fill in the form to gain access to this sample login, they drop into the campaign and the first thing we ask them is, the, is it currently between the 1st of January and the 31st of January? If it's a yes, bang, they get the January email with the January login information. If it's a no, then they flow down to February. And then we ask the question, is it currently between the 1st or the 28th of February? And if it's a yes, bang, they get that email. If it's a no, they continue down through the process. So this now means we have a single campaign canvas versus 12 separate campaign canvases. Now that's an example of where a campaign will in fact run for 12 months and will in fact run over four quarters. So that will be reflected in the campaign reports that they pull based on quarters or whatever the case may be. So that in and of itself immediately saved a huge amount of time uh, for the team because they didn't have to bother with that information. <laughs> One question that was asked uh, by one of the marketers was, okay, Derek, so if we, when we build those emails, do we actually have to have all 12 emails ready to go? And the answer is yes, you do. You can't launch a campaign canvas uh, if you don't have assets attached to the email. So then the next question was, well, could we just simply create an email, save it, and attach it, but that email's not actually ready. And I was like, well, technically speaking, yes, you could, but I've seen that fail miserably in the past where people have then forgotten that this email wasn't actually finished. It actually had nothing in it. It was just an empty shell of an email, and that has actually been then sent on to customers. So just a little bit of a red flag there. If you're adding a camp an email to a campaign or a landing page or a form, before it's activated, you really want to make sure that those assets are fully built and constructed. Don't, um, otherwise you have to make some very serious diary notes to make sure you go back to, to complete the process. This was just one example where through utilizing the automation, um, 
in a fairly basic way, it, it has taken advantage of that new uh, step on the campaign canvas, which is the compare date function, which is a great function, but uh, it certainly made that process quite a bit easier. So the campaign canvas effectively is broken down into a number of areas. You've got your audience, you've got assets, you've got actions and decisions, and there really should be a comma after assets, but that's okay. All right, so let's look at dates as one example. So dates, and especially in the context of events, dates have been a challenge, and this is where I want to show you this new uh, compare date function. We've covered it a little bit before, but just want to reiterate because it really um, does make things a lot easier. So in managing dates, you're able to use the compare date function. And so what this does, it enables you to enables the campaign canvas to be intelligent in knowing what the day is right now when the person enters that particular step. And so this is the function that we used on the example that I just shared with you a few moments ago. And uh, you can get right down to, there's all sorts of operators available. The operator is this piece right here. So the they, uh, is the date between, is it before, is it after? There's a couple of others. We'll sh I'll show you those when we get to, to Eloqua. And so that enables you to be much smarter in relation to the questions you're asking and to route people accordingly. And especially where you've got people coming into a campaign canvas. Um, oh, there we go. I've even got them there. So is it on or before, on or after, on, between, etc. So these are all the various options uh, that you've got available to you. This becomes particularly beneficial, especially where you've got a dynamic segment and you've got people coming into a campaign on a regular basis. So where they're coming in, you don't know what time it is, you don't know what the date is when that person comes in, this can help make sure you're delivering the right message. The easiest example is if you're running an event, uh, you might be three months out from that event, and so you, some of your communications may be worded in such a way as to say, okay guys, we've got 60 days, we've got 30 days, we've got 14 days, and we've got seven days. You wanna make sure that when that email is delivered that it's accurate, and so you could use the compare date function before each email is sent to make sure that uh, the person receiving it is getting the right communication. Now, just one tip for you, and you may forget this one, but this one drove me crazy. When you come in here, what you first of all want to do is select the end date and then select the first date. If you select the beginning date of your time frame, that's typically going to be in the future, and this always defaults with today's date, and then it won't let you do anything on the second one. So always come in and choose the last date first, <laughs> as in the date that is farthest into the future, and then select the date that is closest to you. Now another step, and we talked a little bit about this one earlier, is the shared filter construct. So shared filters um, are a really powerful way to understand what somebody's doing. And as I've said, there, se shared filters is really segmenting on the fly. So where you may be familiar with creating, um, uh, using segmentation and using the filter criteria there, using shared filters on the campaign canvas effectively enables you to, to do segmentation on the fly. So let me show you an example here on a campaign canvas. So what you've got is the segment begins at here, we wait for a period of time. What we can do here is we can use a shared filter to do a number of things. We can ask it, have they registered? We can ask, have they visited a specific page? There can be a whole range of different reasons as to why you would use the shared filter. Um, and you can see that highlighted there again. Now, when you click on the shared filter, uh, or where do you find shared filters, probably the other question, is you go to audience, into tools, you can see here, and then into shared filters, like so. And once you build those shared filters, they can either be campaign specific or they may be something that you ask on a regular basis. So you could create a generic shared filter that simply asks the question, has this person been sent more than three emails within the last 10 days? And if it's a yes, you might route them off to a wait step. If it's a no, you may want to go ahead and then send them another email. So if you're just trying to pull the throttle back a little bit on the number of emails that you're sending to people, uh, shared filters can help you uh, do that. Um, and so as I said, you can have campaign specific shared filters or shared filters that you might use over and over again on different campaigns. So as that process continues, or that particular example continues, you can see the process basically uh, just continues. So there's different shared filters here and here, uh, and then depending on how far down you go, 
um, you can see here we've asked the question, has payment been received? Uh, this one here asks, have they visited a specific page? So a shared filter can ask many different questions and access many different types of data uh, within the system. So again, shared filters are, are very much, I think, an underutilized function of the Campaign Canvas and one that really helps you um, deliver a much more personalized experience. Another one of the basics that people can get a little bit confused with is the evaluation period. These are typically available on the steps like clicked email, opened email, um, visited website, etc. What we're doing effectively is we're asking the question, have they clicked on an email? So we need to identify which email we're referring to, and that's this one right here in this example, um, shown again here. But um, so we're asking the question, has the contact clicked at least one time? And you can see you've got options there to choose. Have they clicked on that email at least one time within the last one week? And again, you can adjust the step here as well. And the evaluation period is set to one week. Now the evaluation period could be three weeks, it could be four weeks. The key piece of information that is missing from this step that you don't see, and unless you're told or you read, um, I don't even know where you'd find it actually from a reading point of view, but the key piece of information is this, is that every 15 minutes, Eloqua will analyze and ask that question. So every 15 minutes for 24-7, Eloqua is going to ask the question, for the period of the evaluation period, there's too many periods there, but for the period of the evaluation period, they're going to ask, has the person clicked at least one time within the last week? Now, as soon as that's a, as soon as that's a positive, the person will then head off in whatever direction uh, that is, so that maybe they get another email, whatever the case may be. However, if at the end of the evaluation period, the response to the question is still no, then, they head off in this direction. The evaluation period can be really quite helpful because it really reinforces that idea of being able to engage with somebody as they engage with you. So for example, if you uh, wanted to use a, a shared list, for instance, or sorry, not a shared list, a shared filter, uh, to see if somebody had clicked on various or very specific pages, and then you wanted to follow up with an email, well, you could do that, and that could be achieved within 15 minutes. Uh, of them actually doing it because Eloqua is checking every 15 minutes to see if that question has in fact been answered. So evaluation periods can be really quite helpful. You can still use a wait step. The other thing you want to think through in a bit more detail is when you're sending them off in this direction, if they're going to another email, they may well have clicked on that email at 2 a.m. So does your business necessarily want to be seen to be sending emails at 2.15 a.m. So you might want to look at doing some scheduling on uh, that email to ensure that it's only delivered within business hours. That's just the other thing to notice. When you set an evaluation period, that little icon, that little black icon that you can see right there, the arrow is pointing to, it's just a little stopwatch effectively. So it's just telling you that there is an evaluation period that has been set, whereas you'll notice up here there is no, no little icon. Some other considerations um, when automating. Some of the key things to think about uh, is certainly scheduling. Uh, you don't want to deliver emails always exactly when people respond. As I said, you may not want to be the type of brand that is seen to deliver things at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Uh, you may want to wait till Monday 9 a.m. to follow through. Um, certainly need to think through start and end dates of campaigns um, and how that can impact reporting. And our encouragement to you is to probably not use the default. Just uh, it doesn't doesn't help the situation generally. Also, when you're thinking about through these campaigns and from a segmentation point of view, you need to think of how much of that data could be coming through from the CRM. So if we set up a filter criteria that asks specific questions, we need to be aware that through the integration, it's very likely uh, that additional people will be added to that campaign and then move through directly to the campaign canvas. So thinking through that process and understanding the benefit of that versus having to create new campaigns every week. Our newsletter is a great example. So our newsletter, Outside the Cube, that campaign runs typically for 30 days. Um, we 
create our audience based on a filter criteria. There's various newsletter or versions of the newsletter depending on who you are. Um, and so we leave that campaign running for 30 days. And in the space of that 30 days, we always pick up additional people through, and that's typically coming through from the CRM. So as the sales team are talking to people, they might add a new customer, they might have a new prospect, etc. And so typically uh, that person will flow into the campaign into outside the cube um, and then they'll be sent the email. Now, of course, you can have a wait step in between the segment and the newsletter because you don't want the salesperson to enter in the CRM. In our case, that will integrate through to Eloqua within 15 minutes uh, and then the longest it would take is half an hour and that person would be added to the campaign and then receive the newsletter. So I think what we do is have a, um, uh, I think from memory, we wait for five hours. Uh, in some cases, we wait a day before that information goes out. So again, these are just considerations, things you need to think about from an automation point of view. How do we do dynamic segments? That's probably the first question because it's generally always the starting point of your campaign. Um, the easiest way to do that is if you're creating a segment based on filter criteria, and it could also be through uh, uploading of an Excel file, what you'll want to do is select the second option here, which is add members regularly until the campaign is deactivated. And you can set the re-evaluation frequency there based on hours, days, weeks, or months, in which case Eloqua will go back to the segment, rerun the filter criteria. If there's anybody else that now also meets that criteria, they can then automatically be added to the campaign. So even if you're uploading information via Excel into that particular segment, that's fine. You can upload it. Uh, and depending on the evaluation frequency that you've set here, those additional people will flow straight through into the campaign and then begin their journey through the campaign, keeping in mind that they're just obviously a few days or hours behind people that were there when you originally launched the campaign. So this particular step is really helpful if you've got a campaign, and the classic example is we're running an event, we've set it off, we've launched it, it's gone, it went yesterday. There's always that one wonderful salesperson who comes back and says, oh, I've got these six people that should have been on that campaign, can we make sure they get the email? The easiest way to make that easy for you is to make sure that you use this second option Option, which is to add members regularly until the campaign is deactivated. You can then just load them directly into the segment and they'll flow straight through onto the campaign canvas. So the scheduling function uh, is available. Once you add the email asset to the actual canvas, then you can do the scheduling. It's simply a matter of, of ticking the box uh, and here you can change information uh, and the windows of time that you want people to receive things and that probably should be not 11 p.m., maybe 4 p.m. And you can also then designate the days of the week that you do or don't want. So we often find um, if we do anything on a Friday, we try to avoid sort of sending anything at 5 o'clock on a Friday. Um, typically not the best time to do that. Um, this is also where you apply signatures. So if you're using personalization within the sales team, this is where you would apply that. And you can have various uh, rules set up within the system uh, to achieve that. Um, and this is where you apply that based on the actual email. And when you apply the signature here on the campaign canvas, that overrides the from detail that you see within the actual email editor as well. The compare date step. Uh, we showed you the screenshot before, but let's have a look. And so here you can see these various options. If I choose tomorrow, oh, sorry, I need to do between, don't I, to get two dates? There we go. Okay. Um, and it's, oh, okay, this is good. I think it's changed itself from what we were doing previously. Okay, so maybe ignore what I said earlier. Um, that's working fine. But you'll see, obviously, depending on the, the operator that you choose here, will depend on, obviously, if it's two dates uh, or one date that's available. But really, really helpful to use this, this uh, new compare date step, uh, especially in the context of an event and making sure that the communications you're sending out and the language that you include in those, uh, those communications is actually relevant to people. So if you want to say, we're, we've got 14 days to go, we've got 10 days to go, we've got a week to go, et cetera, you need to make sure that when that information is sent that it's actually accurate. Okay, and so the compare date step will help you do that. Compare contact fields. The compare contact field really is just a way for you to access any of the fields that you've got sitting on your contact. 
So in, in our world, for instance, if I look at the state field, I can then ask the question, is the person uh, in South Australia? And I can also utilize the evaluation period here as well, uh, etc. and then route people accordingly based on the responses to that particular piece of information. The external activity, uh, there's the contact washing machine. So the contact washing machine, you'll find information within the Oracle uh, Eloqua Cloud Help Center, um, helping you access this information. But you'll see there's a number of functions uh, that the washing machine can perform. Um, but basically what you're doing is you're identifying first of all the field that you want to work with. And let's say if we take first name as an example, um, you can place conditions on it, you don't have to. Uh, but the action that you want to achieve can be any of these. So you can trim left, right, you can make uppercase, make lowercase, proper case. There's a whole swag of things. And, and to get more information about exactly what these do, again, if you go into the uh, help center and look under apps, you'll find the contact washing machine and you'll see a complete breakdown to exactly what this does. And so once you confirm the, let's say, proper case, because we wanted to make sure the first name is correct, you can then add, that's the action, and then the destination would be back to the same field. So we go back to first name. Oops, back to first name, like so. And so that's, you've done, that's easy. So all you need to do there uh, is basically, typically put that before the actual email send. So if you were laying it out on the canvas, it would be something like from here, to here. So that's what your campaign would look like. Like so. Okay. So there's a few little tips. Now, are there a couple of questions there, Marika? There are. Fantastic. What have we got? Kim, hi. Where do you go to get set up email signatures? Yes, good question. Okay. Let me show you that. So the Setting up um, email rules, there's a couple of ways, right? So there's two things you need to factor in. First of all, there's the layout of the signature, and that's purely looking at the cosmetics. So what does the actual uh, signature look like? That's done through assets, components, and signature layout. However, what you're wanting to do is set up the actual rule that determines uh, which email signature will be applied to, a, uh, to an email when it goes out. So let's have a look at this one here. This is our Marketing Cube sales team. And what you can see here basically, you just need to give it a name. You always need to assign a default as with most automation processes. And then effectively what we need to do is work out which field is it that you have on your contact, not just the contact, it can be a custom object or it could be an event registration field, but which, which is the field that defines who the email should be coming from. So at Marketing Cube, we use the salesperson field on the contact to be the source of truth for that information. And that particular field is actually populated from the CRM. So in reality, the CRM is the source of truth. You then select the relevant options here. Typically, you want all of them, up to you. And, and this is the actual field. So on the contact in Eloqua, the field, that is the salesperson field, has the words Adrian Space Jones listed in it. Now it needs to be precise. The other step that you then need to do is identify the user uh, and assign them here under email sender. So just so we're clear, if you're wanting to personalize communications from the sales team, the sales team need to be loaded into Eloqua and they need to be users of Eloqua, but they're non-licensed consuming users. So there's no charge, there's no cost to you as an organization uh, to do that. Okay, so that's where you find rules. Anything else there? No. Okay, we've come just a little bit over. It's 11.02. Happy to stay for a little bit if there are specific questions that you'd like to go through. Kim, did that answer your question? If you could just give us a little confirmation back if you're comfortable uh, with that particular question or that response to your question, I should say. I suppose, guys, um, today's session, and, and uh, as I said, I wasn't sure how we'd really cover the basics in an hour. So hopefully we've covered a range here today that at least has maybe uh, been a bit thought-provoking for you. It's possible we've created more questions than <laughs> for you now that we've maybe provided answers. Uh, but 
please feel free to, oh great, thanks Kim, appreciate that. Yeah, please feel free to email through to either myself, Derek, at marketingcube.com.au. Um, obviously, please visit our website, uh, our blog, you'll find a whole range of information there. Um, we'll be moving all of our post uh, user group communications to the blog. Um, we'll still send you out the email, uh, but we'll give you a link to that and you'll also find uh, replays of previous webinars listed there as well. Next month being December, we typically do this on the fourth Tuesday of the month and so that'll be Christmas Day I think. So while I appreciate your attendance at these events, I won't be hosting an event on Christmas Day. Uh, but we'll see you all back in January. We will we'll be running the face-to-face -face event for those who are living here in Sydney uh, and working here in Sydney and we'll get some details to you for that. But uh, otherwise, please drop us an email, have a look at the blog, add any questions. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. And maybe that's a good opportunity to wish everybody uh, a Merry Christmas and a safe new year. We look forward to seeing you in 2017. Thanks very much, guys. Have a great week.